Thank you, Dwight, for being in the word of prayer. Heavenly Gracious Father, as we again gather here today, we ask that your spirit would, would speak to us through the word, touch our hearts, to touch our lives, that we may not only grow in that grace, but that we may continue to walk in the way you would have us to go. Your name we ask it. Amen. The word of God I'd like to share with you is in the gospel reading. It was very interesting this week when I got the call to, to come here and, and fill in. I uh, started looking at the text for the day. As I got to the gospel reading, I'm going, didn't we talk about this text, part of this, the last part of this text, a couple months ago, a month or two ago? I said, sounds like a text that in January, I remember hearing preached on at the church that I go to. So I called up my pastor and said, by the way, I said, I had to tell him, I said, I won't be here this weekend. I'm preaching over at Calvary. I just wanted to know, let you know that I'm not playing Ethan. Oh, anyway. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I said, by the way, the gospel reading for this week, did, didn't you preach on this a couple of a month or two ago? And he said, yeah, I was thinking the same thing, he said. That, you know, this is the text he repeated this again, you know, the, the, the request by James and John, and I'm going, I wonder what the deal is with this. So I said, well, let me look at the opening verses. So I looked at the opening verses, and those two words jumped out at me right away, amazed and afraid. You know, those, those are kind of two powerful words that impact our lives more than we think. Now, for those of you that weren't here last week, last week I talked about one of the things I talked about in the message was how the lessons all tie in together. And how last week they kind of just really tied in together well. Well, this week they, you got to really stretch. <laughs> you look at that, that Old Testament lesson, it ties into the gospel, talks about that whole thing of that new covenant, you know. Jesus talks about that relationship that he has with the Father that we have through baptism and through that call of the Spirit. The new covenant that's going to put us in a right relationship with God. The epistle reading talks about Jesus as the high priest. Now he's come to, to be the one who saves us. And he has died to forgive us our sins. But how do they talk about being amazed and afraid? You see, the reality of life is, is that you and I, as I shared with the children in the children's talk, many times are amazed and afraid. It's, it's kind of that those two words are balanced in our lives, a dilemma that occurs every day. There are things that just amaze us, and there are things that we are afraid of. And how those two emotions tie together? Well, let me give you a couple of examples. Have you ever been on a zip line? You are amazed at the exhilaration you feel going down that zip line, but you're also afraid that you're going down the zip line. At least I was. Okay. Yeah. Skydiving. I would love to skydive. I, I would be amazed at the view and the scene you do it. But they'd have to pry my hands loose to me before I jump out of the plane. Because I'm so scared of heights. And there's one ride out of the Schlitterbahn that I will not go on. It's the Beirut. Yeah, my German comes through, you know. That's that one that you go way up and then you go to water slide and you go. I like those kind of rides, but you know, geez, walking up there again, you know, the paramedics have to cry my hands loose from those steps to get up there. I want to be amazed, but I'm afraid. And just like all of us, we have we can find those events and those situations where we are at the same time amazed and afraid. Now, the question or the problem that we'd like to focus on today is. How do we as Christians deal with these two words, amazed and afraid? I would like to take you through a little journey as we, we kind of walk through that. And walk through that reality in our life of, of that. That little journey is through the scriptures. Let me take you back to the, through the Bible briefly. Give you some examples of how people have been amazed and afraid at the same time. 
We take you back to 1 Samuel 17. That's the story of David and Goliath. Now, we all know the story of David and Goliath. David is this young boy, you know, who comes up and he's not, you know, and, and, and if you read the context of, of the story of Goliath, the reason nobody squawked Goliath is that they are afraid of him. They're amazed at how big he is. You know how big he was? He was about nine feet tall. In one of my parishes I was in, the kindergarten teacher used to every year have the kindergartners draw a picture of Goliath. And they'd put him in the hallway. And I remember the first year I was there and I stood next to him and I went, Man, I wonder David was afraid. That dude was big. Right? Tall. And yet David is amazed at a couple things. He's amazed that nobody's been willing to fight him. And he's amazed nobody trusts in the power of God to overcome him. This Goliath. Now you know the story. David, he goes and he fights him because he he believes in God's power, and with he is not afraid because he knows that God is going to help him defeat Goliath, which he does. Now I take you to First Kings nineteen, story of Elijah. Elijah has just come off the great Super Bowl battle with the prophets of Baal, in which he has defeated them. Elijah, remember the sacrifice, the most biblical story of Elijah's sacrifice, where they pray all day, the prophet of Baal, they can't get their sacrifice lit. Elijah, he says, let me show you something. He pours water on his, and then God sends lightning down and consumes, and starts a fire, consumes the whole thing. And then they kill the prophets of Baal. A great, amazing, amazing victory, amazing time. And then the queen of Israel says, I'm going to kill you, Elijah. He's off on a run. First Kings 19, Elijah has been nourished and strengthened, worked through his burnout, his depression. And God says, I want you to see something, Elijah. Come out of the cave. He comes out and he sees God's great powerful axe in the mountains and everything like this. And he is amazed. But he's also afraid of the power of God. And God says, just listen to that small, still voice. And answer the question, what are you doing here? And Elijah, again, filled with God's power, does great things. Now I'd like to take you to the Easter story. A couple events in the Easter story are very interesting as we walk through this. Let's go to Resurrection Day. Resurrection Day, you come to an empty tomb, these women and some of the men do, and they are amazed the tomb is empty. But they're afraid because they don't know where Jesus has gone. Who's taking the body away? In that story, I always love the Easter story from this perspective. Why didn't the disciples get it? They watched him raise couple people from the dead, even Lazarus. So when he said he was going to rise from the dead, why couldn't they believe he would do it? But they're afraid. Their fear is so great that, remember the Easter Eve story, the evening story? Where are they? They're in a room. They've locked the door because they think they're going to be next. They're going to come after them. And God amazingly appears to them and shows them that he is risen from the dead, and again empowers them to do great things for him. Now the Easter story is very powerful, but there is a section in the Easter story that kind of gets lost. Matthew chapter 28, towards the end, and it's a story of, it starts at verse 11, okay? And, and, and here's the story of the incident, if you've not read it. When the word gets out that Jesus is not in the tomb, Christians are all saying, he's risen. Okay? The Jews who had put him to death go to the Roman guards and they pay him off. And they say to him, this is the story you tell. You fell asleep at night. No. For those of you who served in the military, what's the punishment for falling asleep in guard duty? It's punishable by death. Especially in times of war. In those days, they just did it, right? 
We'll, we'll, they said, we'll pay enough money and we'll take care of it. You won't get in trouble with the Roman authorities. But you're to tell them this story that you fell asleep and that the disciples came and stole the body away. Then Matthew adds his one little phrase. He says, and this is a story that's being told to this day. If you know anything about the New Testament Gospels, Matthew was written about 68 A.D. For almost 60 years, the story was that Jesus had not been raised from the dead. He had been stolen away. They didn't want that amazement of the resurrection to be known. They wanted people to be afraid that death was the end and there was no more. Now I'd like to turn to our text. Those two were amazed and afraid. You know, when you hear the word amazed, I don't know about you, but for me, I, that word jumps out so many times in the gospel readings. In fact, I looked up 29 times the word amazed is in the four gospels. And where it is, people were amazed at his teaching. People were amazed at the things he did. People were amazed at the miracles, the healings that took place. Jesus was a very amazing person, wasn't he? The New Testament accounts share with us the great things that he does. He shows up 30 years old and in three years does these amazing things. He heals the sick. He raises the dead. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. He touches people. People have such amazing faith in him that one woman believes that it shouldn't even have to ask Jesus to heal him. All she has to do is touch his robe and his amazing healing power will work in her life. That's how amazing he was. Great crowds followed after him. But when he wouldn't be their bread king or their king, they, they no longer saw him as amazing. And on the way to Jerusalem, where he is, there's just a few of his followers, a few of his followers and his disciples that are going with him as they head to celebrate the Passover. But they were still amazed at him and what he was going to do. But they also were afraid. You know, they're afraid because he kept talking about going to Jerusalem, he kept talking about dying. He kept talking about he was going to rise from the dead. And they did not deter him. No matter what they try to say, no matter what they try to do, he keeps, he's so headstrong because he has this amazing mission he has to accomplish. But they are just afraid for him, for their friend, for what will happen. And so, we hear in our text, they try to change the subject. Maybe James and John thought they could get, you know. <laughs> One of the things I remember hearing about this text was, you know, the other ten were indignant because they were mad they didn't think of it first to go to Jesus. But it's amazing. I try to be in his amazing power and glory. But they also were afraid. One of the most Amazing things in our lives is that we are baptized. And that baptism really ties us into this whole Lenten walk. You know, the Lenten walk is about the cross. The Lenten walk is about that empty tomb. That Lenten walk is about how we get to understand we are forgiven. How our great high priest, the epistle reading, has paid the sacrifice for us once and for all. And how this new covenant that Jeremiah talks about is now ours because of what Jesus did on the cross. It was a great, amazing event. And that's what Lent's about. It prepares our hearts and our lives for that walk. To get there, to understand what it means to be forgiven. To understand that this is why I don't have to be afraid anymore in my life, because Jesus has died to forgive me all my sins. That I can stand in fear and trembling and think about what I've done wrong, but also know that because of what Jesus did, I am forgiven. I said our baptism. You know, the baptism, our baptism, in the last years of my life, last years and lately, I've 
really come to understand the great power of baptism in the lives of the people. Always did, but you know, it's taken on a whole different perspective. I've continually been being drawn back to not the act of baptism, where we pour the water on that child or that adult, but before that, what happens? We say to that child, we say to that adult, receive the sign of the cross, both upon your forehead and on your heart, to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. Now, if you want to talk about an amazing moment, if you want to talk about something that gives you the power not to be afraid, it was at that moment. And why do you think God used water? He used to ask my confidence that. Why do you think God used water? You know, the sacraments, one of the great things about the sacraments, if you ever really think about this, is God, through his son, used the, some of the most common elements in the world for the sacraments. It's water. Earth's four-fifths water. Human body is what, 90% water. And he used bread and wine, two staples that exist throughout the world. Water. Luther, I remember reading Luther, and Luther is the one who made that great connection to, me, to water. If you really look at his explanation of baptism, he talks about how we daily wash ourselves and daily renew ourselves. If you really think about it, every morning that you climb in the shower or take a bath, you are rebaptizing yourself. Because that power of that cross that was put on your head, burned into your heart and into your mind, is a reminder that in that power of that water, you are, as you wash the daily grime off of yourself, you also are washing amazingly the daily sins that you have got away because of what Jesus has done. That you don't have to live in the fear of what you've done wrong because through the power of the cross and your faith relationship, you stand in that forgiving moment. Amazing, isn't it? That God cared for us that much. That he connected it to us with that. What did Jesus say to James and John? Can you share my baptism? He says, you have, you will, because of what amazing things I have done. You know, as amazing as God is in our life, yet we are afraid. I have to tell you, folks, the human side of us, that dark side which we talked about last week a little bit, is strong. No matter how strong you are and how faithful you are, how powerful that amazing grace is, there are times when that, 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 that fear that we're not really forgiven kind of overwhelms us. I remember in one of my parishes that I served, I had a young couple that was going through adult instruction, joined our church because they were going to get married. And we had a policy at that church that one of the members had to be, uh, one of the wedding party had to be married for them to be married in our church. So they, their wedding was off, it was about eight, nine months off, and so they were going through the class, and as I looked at them, they were one of those couples that I said, you know, the minute they join the class, I won't see them until the way again, right? You know how you, how you look at human nature, just after you've been around the block a while, you kind of can see these certain characteristics. Well, I was wrong with them. They were in church every Sunday. Then all of a sudden, they missed a Sunday. They missed a couple Sundays, and eventually they missed a lot of them. I guess... <laughs> In my mind, I guess I was right. Well, he ended up in the hospital, and I went to visit him, and I walked in the room, and I said to them, I, you know, it's good to see you. I've missed you in church. And he started crying. And then she started crying. I was going, what did I say? Because I have this habit of, if I have what I call St. Peter's disease, I stick my foot in my mouth a lot. And um, in fact, I have teeth marks around my kneecaps. That's how far it goes in. But anyhow, you know, sometimes I say things that, just a tiny bit of right or whatever. And I said, well, what did I say? What did I do? They said nothing. They, they explained that they had missed the Sunday and they were going to go to the next Sunday and they missed that one. 
Finally, they got him out of the pattern of going. And I said, why didn't you come back? And they said to me, and I remember this, they said, because we were so afraid you'd be disappointed in us for not coming to church. And I said to them, I would never be disappointed. I rejoice and celebrate when you come and worship. And they came back to church. I did their wedding. Before I left that parish, I had the joy of baptizing their first child. Fear can do great things to us in our relationship with Jesus. Sometimes it overwhelms us, and we forget about that great, amazing love, that amazing grace, that amazing power that God has given to us. Maybe that's why we like the song, Amazing Grace. It is such a powerful gospel song because it talks about, not about us, it talks all about what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. It, talks to, and it, it touches almost anybody and everybody at where they're at. Right? I once was lost, but now I'm fine. I'm blind, but now I see. And you go through all those things. And then Chris Town some years ago added another verse different version where you talk about my chains are gone. You know, those things that it, through fear just lock us up. But it's God's amazing grace through the cross, through the empty tomb to show us how much he likes and cares for us and wants to be a part of our lives. And who knows? Maybe you'll be a David that accomplishes Maybe you'll be a Elijah and be able to speak and perform great acts for God. Maybe you'll be a Peter or Paul. Or maybe that amazing grace will just make you who you are and who you need to be. In Jesus' name, amen. And now the peace of God which is beyond our human understanding and comprehension may keep our hearts and minds fixed and his great love and his great grace, his great power, we need to be the people that he would have us to be. In his name, amen. One of the great things, again, is we as Christian people have the ability and the privilege of professing this great amazing love, this great amazing faith that we have. In the words of the Nicene Creed, and I invite you to rise on page 6, turn to page 6 of the worship folders and enjoy with me in making this profession. We believe in one God, the Father of Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified on the conscious fire. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have to happen. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.